Yes, good morning, Mohamed. Thank you very much for that uh, beautiful introduction of myself. Um, I think it was um, as good as it could be, maybe more than it actually is. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, um, improving the clinical outcome in litotripsy. And yesterday, Professor Shossi already uh, gave you his fantastic talk um, about uh, origin, development, and uh, current situation of litotripsy. And um, as we heard this morning that uh, the prevalence of stones are uh, rising and the prevalence of small stones are rising, and I think we can be very happy to have such a pure non-touch technique still at our hands. And um, overall, in, um, the, uh, in the whole world, the majority of stone treatment is performed by litotripsy. Obviously, that depends a little bit on the uh, setup in the uh, respective country. The more operating capacity we have, the higher um, we are, um, the more technology we have on our hands, the more flexible your is. We're going to try to use that. In Germany, for example, um, I think less than 50% of all stones are treated with litotripsy, whereas in uh, UK, for example, there are about 80-85% of um, stone treatments performed by litotripsy. Right. Um, we have it now about 30 years, and um, we had fantastic results at the beginning um, of litotripsy with the HM3. Um, and those results actually, they declined. We have worse stone free rates now. This is due to the technical advances which have made the machines um, smaller, more, more versatile, um, has made them um, as a complete um, and urologic workstation, but the results are worse and the retreatment rates are higher. Um, we have started, um, the HM3 started with uh, treating very specifically only renal pelvis stones and the uh, range of indications has broadened. Um, at the end, people started to treat stack-on stones with this machine. Obviously, you can imagine that stone-free rates have not been great. And why do we want to improve um, litotripsy uh, because we want to save costs, we want to save operating time, we want to um, avoid unnecessary treatments, and we want to make sure that the patient's discomfort time is as short as possible. Um, so if we look what can we change, um, first we need to look what can we not change. We cannot change stone sites, we cannot change the site and the composition, we cannot change the real anatomy, and we rarely can change the patient's anatomy. Um, having an influence on his obesity, his or her obesity, would be a quite difficult thing to do. Um, what can we change? We can, before we do litotripsy, we can get or build a new litotriptor. We can refine the indications, means we need to look which stones are likely to break and which, where we can have good stone clearance. Um, during litotripsy, we can manipulate shockwave rate and energy level, and we can work on the pain control. After litotripsy, we can do the percussion, inversion, and diuresis method, and we can add some drugs to increase stone free rate. We're going to look into that during this talk. So first of all, we're going to look at the new developments of litotripsy. And um, as you know, the HM3 um, derived from the uh, Dornier Starfighter program, and it was a big, heavy machine, it filled the whole room, two C arms needed, um, water bath, uh, general anesthesia needed, a tedious process like surgical procedure. It has a um, big focal point, um, a big round focal point, not a cigar. It was um, hitting the stone nearly with every shot. It was ECG triggered, and um, over the time, machines have become smaller. The focal point has decreased, the aperture has increased. The increased aperture led to less pain over the skin entry area of the shock wave, but we have, as I said, a higher retreatment rate. Right. What is in the pipeline? Um, what are new developments? That's a very interesting concept. It was um, the Direx Do It system, which had two shock wave heads perpendicular in a perpendicular position, which could fire two simultaneous shock waves, and um, it was had promising, um, promising results in the beginning. Um, the stone free rates have been good. However, unfortunately, this machine did not really take off. 
Uh, one reason might be that you can imagine it is difficult to get a proper coupling onto both of those heads in the same time. Another interesting technique out on the market at the moment, it's the Wolf Piezoelectric 3000. Um, as the name says, it's a piezoelectric membrane generating the shock waves and in this uh, particular system you have two piezoelectric membranes um, being able to produce two shock waves which can be focused on one point which can be fired either at the same time or which can be fired in a short delay, uh, meaning that I uh, use the cavitation bubbles which have been generated by the first shock wave um, to with, and um, drive the second shock wave onto them which increases their impact on the stone and which in theory has a very good effect on the stone free rate. Um, however, in reality, stone free rates are not better with this machine with the Wolf Pizza <coughs> than with the other electromagnetic machines. Um, they rather seem to be a little bit lower. So, um, one exciting new technology um, and a new concept, those are the wide focus, low pressure machines. There are a couple of um, producers um, out there, that's Little Space and Little Gold, from, um, those are the um, machine names, the um, companies that is AST and MTS, both are from Germany, and there's a Chinese company, Xi Xin. Um, the uh, underlying concept is that they go back to um, a big focal area, which makes it possible to hit the stone with nearly every shot, even during the movement, the respiratory movement of the kidney and the stone. And at least in vitro, the uh, Chinese machine has been shown to be superior to the old HM3. I think that's an upcoming technique, and um, already a couple of companies jumped onto the train, and I think we should be excited to see what that brings in future. What else is on the market? We have um, stone localization systems. Um, if you ever work with the new machines, you know that you have a touch screen where you can, uh, with a small amount of X-ray used, bring the stone automated in the two planes into the proper position. Um, and you have optical and acoustical tracking systems, which can give you real-time feedback about um, the uh, effectivity of your stone um, fragmentation, what is very helpful for the operator because you have it real-time. Everybody knows that real-time imaging, even with um, ultrasound during stone treatment, is not very reliable. It's quite difficult to see does the stone actually break or not. At the end of the day, you might be firing um, at a pile of small stones, fragments, and the stone has already disintegrated. And those optical and acoustical tracking systems, they could prevent overtreatment. So this is a very nice review by Raswala, Professor Raswala and Professor Shossi recently appeared in the European Urology and they looked at the feature, the technology features of the different litter drifters and they listed nearly everything and I, I draw the red line around the, um, the uh, wide focus low pressure ones and um, as you see there's an EDAP machine the EDAP Sonolith inside, which is um, another very interesting system. This is an electroconductive shockwave source. So we have started off with the uh, spark gap technology in the past, then we had the electromagnetic technology, then we had the piezolith, and um, EDAP is actually um, further developing this electrohydraulic spark gap technology, and they call it electroconductive. It's a spark gap fired in a conductive solution, which eliminates the jitter effect. The jitter effect was the unprecise shock wave of this old electrohydraulic um, system and which is more durable because one downside of the HM3 was you needed to change the shock wave source after every thousand of shots because it, they were simply the spark gap wore out. And um, if we compare the focal sides here quickly, I think you can hear me. And um, then the uh, focal size of the um, Chinese model, for example, is 18. That's quite big. And 
the electromagnetic systems above, like Siemens and the Donny, they have um, medium sized foci. And all of these machines, they have inline ultrasound, they have fluoroscopy on an isocentric C arm, at least the modern machines have that. Um, and I think if you buy a new machine, you should make sure that you have inline ultrasound and that you have an isocentric um, um, C arm that you can have double imaging. Okay, we look quickly at the indications and therefore we have a look at the EAU guidelines. So um, I think it is standard not to treat stones above two centimeter with lithotripsy because the, re the results are known to be bad. So stone more than two centimeter, we go down this uh, renal pelvis stones, stone more than two centimeters. Yes, we do a perk. No, we do a lithotripsy. And um, it's interesting to see that even nowadays, um, URS is not listed on um, as first line option, not even for the stones between one and two centimeters, only it comes to be a second line option in the very small stones. I think that will change in future, we are advancing in URS, but at the moment it's still PNL, TCNL or PERC. And then uh, one exception is the lower pole stone, we have been, um, I spoke briefly about the renal anatomy, um, lower pole stones, uh, we know that are um, have a poor stone clearance uh, results between up to 30-35% stone flow rate. That's very poor. So um, stone flow rates were more prone to perk them. And actually, while it's preparing that talk, I spotted that in the EAU guidelines um, is a spelling mistake. It must mean unfavorable factors, not favorable factors. So if someone is present uh, who could, uh, who is involved there, that could be amended. Um, so what about the ureter? So in the ureter, uh, first choice, uh, lithotripsy only for small proximal stones. And uh, that is based, this recommendation is based on um, um, massive meta-analysis showing actually what you see in the uh, yellow, um, in the yellow field here. that only for this group of stones, for the small stones in the proximal ureter, stone clearance for lithotripsy is better than for URS. And in all the other occasions, we have either URS and lithotripsy equally recommended or even first choice URS for distal ureteric stones more than 10 centimeter. There we are. Um, we will reach a better stone clearance in the distal big stones with the URS. Okay. What are relative contraindications? We already said stones more than two centimeters. We don't want to treat with lithotripsy. We don't want to approach stackhorn stones. However, in children, stackhorn stones might be worth um, attacking with uh, lithotripsy. Caliceal diverticulum stones, like you can see on this upper picture, after it has been filled with contrast, it's a nice diverticulum stones, stone. So this will be, have a poor outcome, most likely. This merits PCNL or URS and opening the caliceal neck. Um, we don't want to take a lower pole stones, and um, if, if we decide to take a lower pole stones, we should have a quick look at renal anatomy. We should look um, how steep is the angle between the lower calis and the ureter. We should look how long is the caliceal neck and how broad is the caliceal neck. If all those factors are against a good stone clearance, we should forget it straight away and proceed to an alternative procedure. Um, what about patient's anatomy? That's the that's the usual middle European customer. Uh, um, and uh, as we heard before uh, by Professor Trancieri, that um, obesity is, uh, or um, uh, high BMI uh, makes uh, lithotripsy treatment likely to fail. And um, shock wave energy is reduced by every six centimeters for 10 or 20%. And, um, the EAU guidelines picked up on that and they recommend actually for severe obese people um, URS and not lithotripsy in the first instance. What about stone composition? We heard too in the previous talk that we can um, doing CT, KOB and measure the Hounsfield units and uh, if the Hounsfield units are higher than 1000 then uh, stone clearance is or stone treatment with lithotripsy is likely to fail. Um, there was a nice paper in the BJU, the National, um, recently published, which actually refined that even a little bit more. They're talking about Hounsfield units of 970, which should be the cutoff for a good stone fragmentation with lithotripsy. So we should aware, be aware how hard is our stone, even with CT, KOB, or by knowing from the patient's stone analysis 
uh, previously what we're dealing with. Um, the concept of emergency literacy is not new. However, it's very promising. And if I would come to the hospital myself, I would have a ureteric stone. I would wish not to have a JJ stand in the first instance. I would not wish to have a URS in the first instance. I would want to have as long as the uh, situation is acute, as long as the peristalsis is still going, I would wish to have an emergency literacy because stone-free rates are very good, more than 80%, and chances are very good to get rid of that stone as long as the system is still working. Um, I would really recommend everybody to introduce such um, a possibility in his own department. Um, we have made a nice study on that and we realized that hospital stay is obviously shorter. Um, days to stone free rate were much shorter, 70 versus three, and overall costs were significant less for um, patients treated with emergency lithotripsy. Um, a couple of quick words to the lithotripsy application. We want to have um, the right shockwave energy settings. We want to have the right onset of shockwave energy and um, we know that the uh, new little cryptors, they can be turned up to 120 shots per minute. That's very convenient for the operator because he will quickly finish the intervention. 3,000 shots of 3.5 are quickly delivered. However, um, we induce a cavitation cloud and every su uh, subsequent shock is absorbed by this cavitation cloud. So um, there are a couple of studies out there and again, uh, Professor Roswell and Chossi, they looked into that. And um, as an example, I have uh, taken um, out the uh, prospective randomized uh, control um, study by PACE. And um, he compared 60 versus 120 hertz. And um, he realized that um, he not also, not only needs less shots until stone disintegration, but also that there was a significant difference in stone rates at three months, 60 versus 45%. So overall stone free rate is quite bad in that study. I don't know why that is, but um, a, um, a lower shock wave rate of about 60 seems to, be, um, seems to be the best thing you can do for your patient. Um, apart from stone free rate, we need to look at kidney damage. Although there is no evidence yet um, that we induce long-term damage by lithotripsy treatment, um, there is short-term damage in the kidney. And um, Lingman actually performed uh, studies on, um, on kidneys um, and in vitro studies on kidneys. And um, 27 shots, 60 shots, or 120, and sh 120 shots from left to the right. And you can clearly see the, with a bare eye that kidney damage is higher in the group of 120 uh, shocks per minute. And um, we know that the rate of, of symptomatic uh, kidney hematomas um, with lithotripsy is 0.5%, something like that. But uh, from CT studies performed on asymptomatic patients, we know that it might be higher, around 4%. So it might not only be good for stone clearance, but also for uh, protecting the patient's kidney. Um, power ramping, if we're treating today with, um, with um, an oral analgesia um, and not general anesthesia, power ramping is a natural process because we're going to start with a low energy and we're going to increase slowly over time. And there are actually a couple of nice studies out that if we increase the power slowly, we're going to have a better result. Why is that? A possible explanation is that the big stone will react very nicely on the low energy and break in itself. After we have broken the big stone to small pieces, we need more energy to overcome the, the uh, sh scattering artifacts and um, to um, or produced by those small stones. Um, <coughs> short word to acoustic coupling, and that's actually a slide I have from my friend Hamid Attar, um, who presented that at the ULIS Congress. Um, we know that the HM3 had the perfect coupling, and then we moved to those um, to this dry coupling with jelly on top of the um, coupling device. And there are now a couple of manufacturers going back and bringing a semi-wet uh, coupling where the patient is lying in a 
small water bath, which I think is a very good idea. And um, we know that the more, the better is the coupling, the better is your shockwave success. And if you have a big air bubble that can reflect more than 99% of your shockwave energy. And um, if we look at um, that very illustrative study again, um, in picture number A, we have a lot of uh, bubbles on the shockwave head. And if we compare the impact on this uh, artificial stone, uh, number A, we see there's only a small hole. And if you go to number D, perfect coupling, no air bubbles, and excellent um, stone fragmentation. So we should take a good amount of jelly, and we should not um, allow any air bubbles to be between the shockwave head and our patient. And if we have a very hairy patient, um, a male hairy patient, it is worth shaving him. So one word to pain control. We know that uh, lithotripsy is less painful nowadays. However, it is still considerable painful. And we want to have the best possible analgesia for our patient because what will happen, um, even if the patient does not want it, he will move away from the shock birth source involuntarily. So he will slowly go out of the target and we will have a limit of shockwave energy we can apply and we will have a limit of shockwave numbers we can apply. So proper um, pain control is essential for a successful treatment. And baseline drugs are NSID, like Dic diclofenac or ibuprofen, and uh, they can be topped up with morphines um, on demand. I think that's a very promising concept. And I see we need to speed on a little bit, so we do that. Um, that was pain control. Um, interesting, uh, two words to that. Interesting alternative methods should be explored a little bit more, like acupuncture or music or um, uh, nitrous oxide, um, which has been uh, recently been revived. And um, yes, if we treat our patients with two hours of crunch music, um, he will surely have a very bad um, experience. Um, a quick word to percussion, inversion, and diuresis. It's a very good concept. I really like that what I do to my patients. I show them, actually, uh, to do a handstand to the young male ones. I show them how to do it on the wall. I would, I would do it here, but I'm, I'll show you, but I think the wall is not very reliable, and it will might, be, might, uh, might break down. <coughs> However, um, if they cannot do a handstand, um, it is helpful if they go head down if they have increased fluid intake and if you have someone tapping their backs. And there are a couple of studies out there showing it actually leads, especially for lower pole stones, for a good, to a good stone free rate. However, I must say, in reality, it is a tedious thing. It costs time, money, and manpower, and this concept did not really take off. Are you want drugs? Very important. We should at least at an alpha blocker to our treatment because the alpha blocker has shown to significantly reduce the time to stone expulsion. It will not increase our overall stone free rate. That's not true, unfortunately, but it will decrease the time until the stone is out. Um, other drugs like calcium channel blockers or cortisone, uh, especially calcium channel blockers, they might be helpful too. Um, side rate is um, very helpful, especially for patients with um, residual fragments. Side rate has clearly shown to reduce the recurrence rate and um, to um, reduce the regrowth of residual fragments. And lastly, we should not forget to do a proper metabolic workup of the patients as soon as they're stone free, because we know that the patient needs to be stone free to have proper result, and only then we can prevent proper probably prevent uh, the recurrence. Okay, take home message. So there are promising new technical concepts, especially the low pressure wide focus and the electroconductive system. We should take care that we have the right indication, that we look at the patients and the renal anatomy, that we look at the Hounsfield units, that we consider the concept of emergency lithotripsy, and we should have an ideal application. We should make sure that you have good coupling, that we have good analgesia, that we use additional drugs like citrate or alpha blockers, and then we will have a very good result with a little tripter. And we will not look like that we did yesterday on the desert rally, uh, helpless um, at a sophisticated machine and not knowing 
what we shall do with it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Chris Jung-Bath.